This is chapter 8, part A, Microbial Genetics. So virtually all of the traits that we've discussed so far this semester are controlled or influenced in one way or another by genetics and heredity. So things like the shape of the cell, is it a caucus or a bacillus, a rod? Uh, structural features like the cell wall composition, is it gram positive or gram negative? Its metabolism, so what type of energy it uses? Motility, does it have flagella? Is it able to swim or move? And how it interacts with other cells, so does it produce antibiotics? So all of these characteristics are going to be passed down to offspring through the generations through genetics. So in this chapter, we'll look at microbial genetics to better understand how new diseases emerge, um, some relatedness among different organisms, and how genes are expressed and regulated. Looking at the structure and function of genetic material, when we talk about genetics, we're just talking about the study of genes. So how they carry their information, how that information is expressed via traits, and how genes are replicated. Chromosomes are the structures that physically contain the DNA and carry that information. So the chromosomes are going to contain the genes. So a gene is just a specific segment or region of the DNA, the chromosome, that codes for one functional protein. And when we talk about the genome, we're talking about all of the genetic information in a single cell. The genetic code is a set of rules or instructions that determine how a nucleotide sequence or a genetic sequence is converted into a functional amino acid and protein. So remember the central dogma of DNA, kind of the underlying principle of all biology, is that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into protein. So basically, how do we go from the recipe in a cookbook, right, words on a page, to an actual three-dimensional functioning product? And remember, it's the sequence or the order of the bases or the letters in the genetic code that determine the arrangement of the amino acids and the shape and function of the protein. Genotype and phenotype are referring to the genetic makeup of an organism or the physical expression of a genetic trait. So in this example, the phenotype would be blue eyes. The genotype is little b, little b. So in this example, blue eyes is recessive. So you have to have two copies of the little b allele or gene right, to express the blue eye trait. Whereas a brown eye phenotype could have two possible genotypes. So brown eyes in this example is dominant, big B. So a brown eyed person could have two copies of the brown eye allele, big B, big B, or they can have one copy and be a carrier for the recessive allele. So think back in high school biology when you had to do the Punnett squares. Right? So this person right, could potentially have a blue-eyed child if they inherited right, this recessive allele from both parents. Bacteria usually have a simpler single circular chromosome. Um, but it's going to still be made of DNA and a few proteins. But remember, prokaryotes do not have a nucleus, so their DNA is just kind of loosely floating in the cell in that nucleoid region. The DNA and chromosomes can consist of millions of base pairs, right? millions of those letters. However, it does not usually always consist of back-to-back -back gene sequences. From what we know, um, in the last 10, 20 years, studying the Human Genome Project is really only about 2% of our genome has any function. The rest of it is just kind of maintenance or just junk filler, um, kind of evolutionary baggage DNA. So short tandem repeats are just repeating sequences of some non-coding DNA, so kind of some space fillers um, to separate gene sequences, but they don't really do anything, right, except take up space. But they are useful in things like DNA profiling and establishing evolutionary relationships based on how many repeats of these non-coding sequences an organism has. The flow of genetic information can go two directions. 
So if it goes vertical, we're transferring genetic information from one generation to the next. So a parent cell produces an offspring cell with that same genetic code. So kind of like a family tree. So you have the parent and then the offspring below. Horizontal gene transfer is going from the neighboring cells. So maybe unrelated cells, they're just in the same area, same environment, um, that are somehow able to exchange genetic information. So there are a few ways for horizontal gene transfer that we'll look at later in this chapter. But with vertical gene transfer, all the offspring should ideally receive identical chromosomes to the original parent cell. With horizontal gene transfer, we may have some recombination and new combinations of genes. So in order to fully study and understand genetics, you need to know about DNA and DNA replication. Remember, DNA is a double helix molecule, so kind of a twisted ladder type structure. So the backbone of this molecule, I think the sides of the ladder, are made up of repeating sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate groups. The rungs of the ladder then are your bases, so your A, T, C, and G. So these bases are held together by weak hydrogen bonds. It's shown here with these black dots. So remember back in 2113, we talked about chemistry and the types of chemical bonds. Hydrogen bonds were more of weak attractive forces, kind of like um, with water and surface tension. Um, they're not true chemical bonds in the sense of the word that they're exchanging or sharing electrons. Um, it's just that kind of weak magnetic attraction. So this means that um, it's relatively easy to break these bonds. Right? So why would we want to be able to easily break the bonds in our DNA molecule? Well, for replication. So when we replicate DNA, we're going to have to unzip these two strands and break these bonds. And we don't want to have to use a whole lot of energy in this process because cells are always undergoing DNA replication. The two strands of DNA are said to be anti-parallel. So meaning they're parallel in the sense that they're you know, lined up together, but anti in the sense that one is just flipped upside down. So we can kind of distinguish the, quote, top and bottom of the DNA molecule by looking at the five prime and three prime ends. So you can always tell which end is the five prime end because it contains the phosphate group. Right? So remember, our backbone is just sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate. So the five prime end is going to end with a phosphate group. The three prime in is just the five carbon sugar. So this will be where we add new bases when we make new DNA strands. So we'll just add phosphates to the quote bottom of our DNA molecule. Right, so same thing over here, we'll just add bases right, to our upside down anti-parallel strand. And remember it's the order or the sequence of these bases or letters in DNA that's going to form those genetic instructions. So just like words in language, right? So the order and arrangement of the letters could have different meanings and form different words. So different arrangements of these bases, ATCG, can code for different proteins. So DNA is double-stranded because one strand is going to serve as a template for a second strand. So before we can make new DNA molecules, we have to separate or unzip our original parent strand um, with an enzyme called DNA helicase. So again, remember all enzymes, or most enzymes end in ACE. So if you see ACE, then you know we're talking about an enzyme. So helicase is going to unwind the double helix and separate these strands and create what's called a replication fork. So kind of like a proverbial fork in the road. Right, so now we have two separated individual strands that we can start to add new bases to and form new DNA molecules. DNA replication is said to be semi-conservative. Right, so conservative means you want to kind of hang on to what you have, conserve you know, what we have. Um, semi means kind of, so we're kind of conservative in that DNA replication is going to result in two 
new identical daughter molecules that are composed of one original parent strand shown in blue and one newly synthesized strand shown in red. So again, this process begins with DNA helicase, separating the strands, kind of unzipping those genes, right, that DNA, um, and creating this replication fork. So we now have two individual exposed strands. DNA polymerase, another enzyme, is going to add new bases or nucleotides to our growing DNA strand. Remember, nucleotides or new bases are going to be added in the five prime to three prime direction, meaning they're added to that three prime end. So remember, five prime had the phosphate group attached, right? So that's, say, the top of the DNA. The three prime end right, doesn't have a phosphate. So this will be where we add new bases. We add a new sugar phosphate nucleotide. So this process is initiated by an RNA primer, which is kind of just a temporary holding place um, to kind of prepare the DNA strand and let the DNA polymerase know where to begin adding the nucleotides. So with our replication fork, right, we have two new strands being synthesized. So one strand will be synthesized continuously. This is called the leading strand. So it's synthesized continuously and leading because it's adding bases right to that three prime end is going in the same direction as our helicase, right? So as it's going in the same direction as the unzipping of the DNA molecules, kind of just following right behind that DNA helicase. Our other strand, however, because it's anti-parallel, so it's upside down, right? We still have to add the bases to that three prime end. So this is called the lagging strand because it's synthesized discontinuously. So we can only add bases in short fragments, um, and then we have to go back later and join those fragments together. So, right, so the replication fork is coming, going in this direction, right? But we have to add bases in the opposite direction. So we can't just continuously add bases, right, and we'll hit that dead end. So DNA is synthesized in fragments called Okazaki fragments. Right, so just short pieces at a time, we'll do a segment, then we go back, right, we do another segment, and we go back, do another segment. Um, and then at the end, another enzyme called DNA ligase is going to join those fragments together. So then we have a continuous DNA molecule. So DNA ligase is going to base pair these ends of our DNA Okazaki fragments and form a ligation. So ligation, think like tubal ligation. So when you get your tubes tied or a ligature, you can make a tie around something. So ligase is just going to form a ligation or a ligature and tie these DNA fragment ends together. So normally in my lecture class, I would show a brief video showing this process in action, um, but I'll add a link below this video if you want to pause here and then go and watch that short video to see DNA replication in action. But here is just a brief clip from another video showing the leading and the lagging strand. Right? So here's our parent molecule. It's being replication for it. Right? So it's being split apart here. The leading strand, right, just continuously cranking out new DNA. However, our lagging strand, we have to do in loops or fragments, right? And then come back around and start another fragment. So this is your leading strand versus lagging strand. So DNA replication is pretty genius in that the energy required for this replication and synthesizing new DNA molecules is supplied by the nucleotides themselves. So they kind of self-power their own replication. So remember with ATP, the primary energy molecule, it had those three phosphate groups. So normally for ATP, we just cut off the one phosphate and use that energy. Well, for the nucleotides, um, we just cut off two phosphates, right, release that energy right, through hydrolysis. Right, so we split with water that chemical bond, right, and now we have our new phosphate sugar, right, link in our chain. So again, this is why the bases are only added to that three prime end, because there's already phosphate up here at the five prime. So we need to add new phosphates to the bottom 
of the DNA. Since bacteria have those single circular chromosomes, their DNA replication is usually bidirectional. Right? So they have two replication forks that start at one end of the circular chromosome and terminate at the opposite end. Right? So therefore, each offspring is going to receive one identical copy of that parent DNA molecule. DNA replication is usually highly accurate due to our built-in safety measures and proofreading capability of DNA polymerase. So just like when you're typing pretty fast and you make a typo, but you notice your mistake, you realize it right away, so you just back, backspace, backspace, correct it, and then you move on. So DNA polymerase um, can kind of catch when there's a typo in the sequence, um, notice that mistake, and then correct it before continuing. So we don't want to allow any mutations to persist in the genetic code. We want all of the daughter cells and the offspring cells to have virtually identical DNA. But occasionally mistakes do happen. Mutations do occur, obviously, which we'll talk about later in this chapter. RNA is another nucleic acid similar to DNA that's very important in protein synthesis. The RNA stands for ribonucleic acid because it's composed of a ribose sugar. So remember in DNA, the D was for deoxyribose. So they're both five carbon sugars. The only difference is this one's missing an oxygen, hence the deoxy. So all nucleic acids, RNA and DNA, are composed of nucleotides. Right? So remember the basic structure or building block of DNA and RNA is a five carbon sugar, either ribose or deoxyribose, that phosphate group, right? So here's our backbone, our sugar phosphate backbone, and one of those four bases. So in DNA, the bases were A, T, C, and G, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine. RNA is slightly different in that it uses uracil in the place of thymine. So where adenine pairs with thymine in DNA, adenine will pair with uracil in RNA. Another primary difference between RNA and DNA is RNA is single-stranded. So why doesn't RNA need a second strand? We said DNA, the DNA is double-stranded for replication purposes, right? So remember we unzip and separate the strands and then we add bases, new bases to form new strands. So we have that semi-conservative replication. Well, RNA doesn't need a second strand because RNA doesn't replicate like DNA. RNA is more of, think of it as a temporary copy right, of our genetic information. There are three types of RNA, and they're all, they all play some role in protein synthesis. Ribosomal RNA, or rRNA, is going to form an actual physical component of the ribosomes. Transfer RNA, or tRNA, are going to transfer and transport our amino acids to our growing protein chain during protein synthesis. So remember, proteins are just chains of amino acids linked together. So tRNAs are going to deliver those amino acids to our protein chain. Messenger RNAs, or mRNA, are going to carry the message that's encoded in DNA to those ribosomes. So mRNA is just your temporary copy or your transcript of the DNA sequence. That's then going to be translated by the ribosomes and the tRNAs. So DNA is the genetic blueprint for all life. So it's going to provide the instructions for protein synthesis using these RNA intermediaries, right, or these temporary messengers. So again, remember that central dogma of, D of biology is that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is then translated into protein. So transcription is going to copy the genetic information from DNA into a complementary mRNA strand. And then the cell, the ribosomes, will translate that information to synthesize our proteins. So it's just like the analogy of a recipe in a cookbook. So in eukaryotes, we have a nucleus. Right? So our DNA is in a library. Right? So it's protected in that library. So DNA right, is your cookbook. There's all kinds of recipes, you know, hundreds or thousands of recipes in one cookbook. 
Right? We don't want to make all of those recipes at one time. We only want one particular recipe for chocolate cake. So in this library, you can't check out books, but you can make photocopies. So we just make a copy of that one page that we're interested in, right? and then we take it out of the nucleus. We take it home, right, to the cytoplasm in our kitchen, right? where then we have our ingredients, our amino acid building blocks for the protein, right, add them in our mixing bowls, our ribosomes, right, we're going to put these amino acids together, and right, we have a fully functioning protein or a cake that we can now eat. So how do we go from the words on a page to an actual cake? So in prokaryotes, they don't have a nucleus, right? So their DNA is just kind of floating out in the open um, right near the ribosome. So translation and transcription can actually occur simultaneously with your prokaryotes because the mRNA will be exposed to the ribosomes pretty much as soon as it's synthesized. We said transcription involves synthesizing a complementary strand of messenger RNA from a DNA template. Right? So we're just basically copying or getting a transcript of the genetic sequence in DNA, right? so the recipe for our protein, um, and just converting it to mRNA. The process of transcription begins when RNA polymerase binds to the promoter sequence um, or just where the gene begins. So we know we have a defined start and stop point. Right? So the beginning and end of a sentence, right? beginning and end of our gene. So your promoter is that starting point where the gene begins. Right? So we want to make sure the RNA polymerase right, makes a copy of the entire gene. We don't want to leave any letters out because then we could have an incomplete protein. Transcription proceeds in the five prime to three prime direction, just the same as in DNA replication, right? Because it's still a nucleic acid, it still has that sugar phosphate backbone, right? So we have to add those phosphates to the RNA, right, at that three prime end. During transcription, only one strand of the DNA is transcribed. So we're not going to make mRNA copies from both strands. Why? Well, because the strands are complementary, so both strands contain the same information. So we only need one strand to get that sequence and that genetic code. So transcription ends when RNA polymerase reaches the terminator sequence, right, or the end of the gene. So kind of the period at the end of our genetic sentence. So now we have a complete mRNA strand that can then go on to find a ribosome and be translated into a protein. So this process allows the cell to produce short-term copies of genes that can be used as a direct source of information for our protein synthesis. So mRNA is just your intermediary, your temporary copy between our permanent storage of DNA right in the library right, and our functioning protein. Translation is where that mRNA is going to be translated or interpreted into the language of proteins. So you can think of codons as the words of protein synthesis language. So codons are groups of three mRNA nucleotides or letters that code for a particular amino acid. So the genetic code is read three letters at a time. So every three letters codes for a specific amino acid. There are a total of 61 sense codons that code for the 20 amino acids. So they're called sense codons because they code for actual amino acids and components of proteins. The other few codons are just stop signals. So they don't actually call for a specific amino acid added to the protein. Right? So these are your non-sense codons. You may notice that there are some amino acids that have multiple codons right, that code for them. So there are four different codons that code for the same proline amino acid. Right, there are four codons for valine. Right. So this is called the degeneracy of the genetic code. So just meaning that each amino acid is coded by several codons. So this is kind of a built-in protection mechanism as well against mutations. So say 
we have a mutation in our gene from ACU to ACC. So our U mutated to a C. Well, it's still going to code for the same amino acid. So overall, it should be a fairly neutral mutation and we should not have any negative effects because our protein is still going to come out the same. So the codons are read in order, just like words in a sentence. Um, and the correct amino acid would be assembled into that growing chain. So again, just how we have 26 letters in our language that can make up over 400,000 words. Right? And then we can put those words in an infinite arrangement of sequences to make different types of sentences. The same thing with the genetic code. So those four letters in DNA, ATCG, code four, are 20 amino acids. And those 20 amino acids can combine in different formations to form over 100,000 proteins in all the life we see today. And just how our words represent certain images, these DNA words and codons represent certain amino acids. So CAT right, represents a cat. Right? But if we change this letter to an R, right, it's a completely different picture. Translation is always going to begin with a start codon, AUG, methionine. Um, so this is the beginning start point, kind of the promoter region of the gene. Right? So we know where to begin and start translation. Translation ends at one of these three stop codons or these nonsense codons. So as the ribosome is reading our mRNA and translating it, tRNA molecules are going to transport, right, they transfer RNA molecules are going to transfer the required amino acids to the ribosome. In order to ensure we're attaching the correct amino acid, tRNAs have what's called an anticodon that will base pair with our codon. Right? So our codon, our start signal for methionine is AUG. So the only anticodon that would base pair and match up with our start signal, or AUG, would be UAC. So this is how we ensure that we're adding the correct amino acid that's being coded for. So as we add new amino acids to the chain, they're going to be joined by peptide bonds. So peptide just means protein. So polypeptides or proteins, peptide bonds form these proteins. So our second codon is going to pair with its tRNA and anticodon. And the ribosome will continue kind of along the mRNA, translating and adding amino acids. So there are three binding areas in the ribosome. So I think there are three seats right, on this ribosome. So we have an A site, right? so your A seat, your arrival seat, um, the P site, the primary seat, and the E site, or the exiting seat. So as new tRNAs arrive, right, we're just going to kind of shift down the line. As we add our amino acids, right now the tRNA at the E site is empty. Right? So we've removed its amino acids. We no longer need this tRNA, right? so it will be released. So the ribosome will just continue chugging along this mRNA, adding new amino acids right, every three bases. Once we reach that stop codon, right, so it's a nonsense codon, again, because it's not going to add or contribute an amino acid to our chain, right, so this is just kind of the period on our genetic sentence, so we know where to stop, right, so we don't need to add any more. Our protein is complete. The newly synthesized polypeptide is released and forms a new protein. The ribosome will detach from the mRNA, and the tRNAs are released. So in bacteria and prokaryotes, because they don't have a nucleus, remember transcription and translation can occur simultaneously. So there's no nucleus isolating the DNA from the ribosome. So as soon as the mRNA is synthesized, um, the ribosomes can attach and begin making proteins right, as we're still synthesizing new mRNA. Transcription in eukaryotes is a little bit different because our cells are a little bit more complex and we have that nucleus. So transcription and translation are separate events in eukaryotes because of that isolation of the DNA in the nucleus. So transcription occurs in the nucleus 
And then the RNA will leave the nucleus and enter the cytoplasm where it will find a ribosome for translation. Also, eukaryotic mRNA must undergo a little bit of processing before it leaves the nucleus and can be translated. So remember we said the genetic code isn't end-to-end gene-on-gene. -gene. There are a lot of kind of non-coding junk DNA segments between the genetic codes. So we don't want to make copies of the junk DNA that doesn't code for anything that we don't need. Right? So we'll snip out the, the non-coding DNA right? and then splice together our coding, DNA, usable DNA. So exons are the regions, these purple, darker purple, regions of DNA that actually code for protein. So these are your expressed regions, right? Exons are expressed. Introns are these interrupting regions of non-coding DNA. So they don't code for anything. Um, they're just kind of that space filler junk DNA. So introns are your intervening or interrupting sections. So in order to remove these introns, uh, we use what are called small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. Right? So that's a mouthful. Um, so for short, we just call them SNRPs. Okay? So the SNRPs are going to snip out the introns, and then they're going to splice together the remaining exons. So just remember your SNRPs, they snip and splice. I think that's easier to say than small nuclear ribonucleoproteins. So summing up transcription and translation, right, so genetic information in DNA is going to be transferred to a temporary copy of mRNA by transcription. Right, so we separate the DNA, just use one strand as a template to make our complementary strand of mRNA. And remember in RNA the difference was we use uracil in the place of thymine. So during translation, the mRNA will attach to a ribosome, and tRNAs will deliver the appropriate amino acids as directed by the specific codons. Right? So remember, genetic code, mRNA is read three letters at a time. So every three letters is one codon, codes for one specific amino acid. So the ribosome assembles these amino acids into the proteins until it reaches that stop signal. Right, so I've posted another video um, below showing this process of transcription and translation.